Hi, I'm Simon Cooper and I'm Communications Lead for the Green Commodities Programme here at the UNDP. Uh, and I have with me on the line from the Philippines, Cal Joffreys, who's Advisor for Strategic Innovation at UNDP and teaches Design Across Borders at Stanford's D School. Well, Cal, welcome. We have got a 90 minute seminar that people can watch if they want the full details, but we thought let's try and distill things down here. So if I'm transitioning from face-to-face -face meetings to online meetings, what would you say are the main differences I need to be aware of? Well, thanks, Simon, and it's great to be a part of this, so thank you for the invitation. You know, I think when, when people transition from the in-person meetings, conferences, workshops, uh, into digital ones, one of the main things to think about is how to make it more human. You know, one of the big challenges whenever we're in a conference call, uh, you, you have all of these blocks and these names of uh, faceless people that are that are kind of tuning in. I love to get people to turn on their webcams. I, I really try to design when I do workshops, um, energizers or things that get uh, people to know each other personally to to see each other a little bit these are some of the spontaneous interactions that you might see you know in an in-person workshop but in a digital workshop it's a lot harder to have that spontaneity so so you may need to design it in uh, and be intentional about it that builds the trust the right context for people really to work together uh, a second thing is around uh, designing sort of micro exercises so it, it's really challenging to actually get people to sit in front of their computers or a screen for a full day or for two days um, and yet that's how many of our workshops are designed it's definitely possible but the challenge for a facilitator is to really think about actually how can i turn all of this into five or ten minute blocks of time where each time we switch from one block to the next i am changing the view that participants have maybe it's a new speaker maybe we're going into breakout rooms maybe it's some kind of different activity that we're doing together so so you're really thinking about actually what are the the micro activities that people are doing uh, across the day and, and to keep them really engaged through the whole process so it's not one big meeting it's a series of activities strung together for interest what does that lead to Exactly. So one of the big differences that leads to is if you think about a workshop agenda, it will gen generally have some big blocks of time. You have half an hour, an hour, an hour and a half to have a discussion about a certain topic. And what you're doing as a facilitator for a digital session is you're breaking that down into much smaller pieces. But you're not just thinking about, okay, here's what people are going to talk about during this session. You're going a little bit deeper and thinking about what's the process that people are going to go through to make sure that people are on the same page about what the facts are, to generate a set of options, and then to, to actually make a decision. So you're really going beyond an agenda uh, all the way into a process. Breakout rooms are something that people have available in Zoom. What do they do to the, uh, the rhythm of the meeting? So it's a great thing to kind of shake things up, but also to make things much more personal. Uh, you, can, you can also kind of get different groups working on separate activities at the same time. So let's say you have a workshop and you want to address, you know, four or five different themes. You can send people into breakout rooms. And, you know, just like we're on video now, a group of four to five people can be on video together. It's a great way to start getting people to know each other at the very beginning of the workshop. I like to do a breakout room early on so that uh, people can kind of introduce each other. They have a bit more of a personal conversation rather than sort of having all 30 people um, sort of in, in one view. Um, so those are two things that I really love to do with breakout rooms. And what are the sort of pitfalls you see? What, what, what sort of mistakes do people com commonly make? I think one of the biggest is that people take the workshop or conference and try to directly translate it online. There often needs to be a, a recognition that actually uh, many of these things don't directly translate online. You can do day long, two day long, even three day long workshops online, but the design is going to often be very, very different. You know, earlier this week, I had someone um, asking me about how to do a launch event. So their organization is a development bank. Um, they launch new products and, and, you know, people introduce the products and then other people kind of give feedback. Um, and it all happens in an auditorium. And he was saying, you know, people leave the room with a real sense of energy uh, afterwards. 
And so you want to think about actually how are you going to design that in? Because clearly you're not going to get that sense of energy uh, just by doing a video conference, right? Uh, there are, are smaller activities, there are smaller ways to get everyone engaged. Um, having a, a mural together or a document that we're all working on where um, people are sort of maybe mapping out the journey that someone might use to, to go through that product or to use that product and what are some of their bits of feedback at different points and then kind of bringing that up, showing it to everyone, uh, uh, maybe addressing a few of the points you know there are there are um, many ways that you can actually start taking that and making it multimodal so it's not just audio it's not just video but it's also us you know working together on some kind of product or, or a document so so the translation and recognizing that that translation is, is often um, essential important it's not a direct translation it can look very different in an interactive setting is is really really important um, I think that there are some big things around how people connect so one setup, uh, you, you have three different setups that you can have around a work, online workshop or some kind of conference, right? One setup is you have two rooms that are connected to each other. So each of these rooms has a certain number of participants and then through video conferencing facility, they're both uh, connected to each other. Uh, another setup is you could have a blended setup. So you have a room of people which are all together in the same room and then you have people that are kind of dialing into that conference. And the third setup is one where everyone is distributed. So you have a call but everyone is on video conference just like everyone else. Now, the, the best setup, I think, in many cases, is actually the third one, a, a fully distributed setup, because that means that everyone is on equal footing. The worst setup, in many cases, is actually the mixed setup, because what happens is it's very easy for the people in the room to have a conversation with each other and to have, kind of have that rapid back and forth. It's really difficult for the people that are dialing in to be able to butt into that conversation, to productively contribute. You know, someone gets up on the right whiteboard and writes something, and then no one else can see it. You know, there, there are a lot of problems with that mix setup. And, and in many ways, the, the problems of the mix setup also exist in the kind of two connected rooms um, setup. So I, I think really um, recognizing what is a, a setup that works well, uh, and that's going to put everyone on, on equal footing is, is essential. Um, and then I think, uh, uh, you know, a last piece that I'd mention is around the ground rules. So really having a strong facilitation, uh, someone who can uh, ensure that, you know, people get cut off uh, uh, when uh, they need to be cut off. Um, but having explained that actually, you know, what, we're going to let people share for two minutes and then we're going to move on to the next person and we've got a timer here or, or you, you display a timer that's visible to everyone in the, in the workshop. I, those kinds of things are really essential because um, there are, are certain places in workshops where, and, and particularly during share outs, where uh, you can completely derail the agenda. This is true for in-person workshops just as much as, as digital ones, but I think people get much more impatient uh, uh, much more quickly uh, in digital workshops. So, so I think really setting some good ground rules, getting everyone to agree to them and actually enforcing them around things like time and, and time boxing of activities um, is going to make things um, really fast paced, energetic and, and productive and, and create an experience that um, um, that is just as good uh, as an in-person workshop. I have my uh, essential technical tool here for timing. It's amazing how well that technology. works. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so um, you don't just do it on your own, do you? Because if you're putting a face-to-face -face workshop on, you wouldn't lay out the chairs yourself and wire up the public address system yourself. It's good to have a team around you. What, what would you have in that team? Yeah, that's so true. And the technical side is is a really important aspect to always take into account, right? You don't want to have um, a situation where you have 20, 30 people waiting because you can't get the video working or the whatever it is, right? Um, so I usually have a few people who will support me um, either as co-facilitators. So if we have breakout rooms, they're kind of jumping in between the different breakout rooms, checking how participants are doing, helping answer questions. Um, but there can also be a logistical team essentially uh, to support the, the the delivery of the workshop uh, so I have I'll usually have someone to help manage the breakout rooms um, in some cases we'll use tools like mural or, or Miro and uh, these tools are essentially like shared whiteboards 
boards or, or, or shared posted boards that everyone can look at. And we'll run activities with, let's say, voting. So I might need someone to help turn on the voting and then close the voting sessions for those uh, for those breakout rooms. Uh, might need someone to start timers and end timers. Uh, those are sort sort of a few of the things that uh, are really important to have support for, especially as you start to get into the larger workshops. I mean, 20, 30 people is already useful to have facilitators, uh, co-facilitators if you're doing an in-person workshop. Um, sometimes even you know, the workshops can get into you know, 100, 200 people, then you absolutely really, really need to have uh, some people who are thinking about these things and addressing them in the back end for you because the last thing you want is uh, to be worrying about these things while you're trying to deliver content, while you're trying to you know, manage people, the conversations that people are having. Now, a lot of this is written down on uh, some guidance documents that you'll find elsewhere on, on the page where this video is living. There's also a fantastic 90-minute seminar which uh, Cal hosted for colleagues within the UNDP that goes into a lot more detail and you can actually see these tools like Mural uh, being used. So let, let's bring this to a close now because people will be wanting to go off to those other resources. If there was one thing you could say to people who are about to do their first online meeting, having been experienced in doing face-to-face -face meetings, what's the one thing you'd say to them? Sure, I would say, think about how to design for the things that are the less obvious things that bring value to your workshop, right? So, so the workshop agenda and the workshop process are the, the kind of tip of the iceberg, right? And that's what everyone knows we're, we're here for and we're here to have those discussions. Uh, there's also the underlying value of the workshop. So, you know, I, I talked to someone last week that was saying a big part of the value of our conference is that there are a whole bunch of NGOs that get together on the side and then they write a statement together, right? Um, in some cases, you know, the, the advantage of having an in-person workshop is that um, government officials, which might normally be very difficult to access, suddenly these CSO, uh, the civil society organizations, stakeholders or other partners are able to talk to them to have conversations and build relationships. Right? That's kind of the underlying value of a, of a workshop that doesn't really have to do with the content. It's almost everything that happens in the coffee breaks, right? Now that's not going to happen automatically in your digital workshop. So really think about how do you design that piece in. And then the last piece um, is the emotional value uh, of it, right? So, so there's a certain experience, you know, we're all in this together, the excitement of a product launch or whatever it is. Um, and, and so I think you want to think not just about you know what is the agenda and what is the process but what is the underlying value of the workshop what's the emotional uh, sort of elements and how can we intentionally design those in and work with different participants and facilitators to make those happen well good advice Carl Joffres thank you very much thank you Simon